Welcome to the LSU Sports Insider, brought to you by the journalists at The Advocate, NOLA.com, and The Times Picayune. Perrin Keyes here in your upper left box, uh, joined today by Koki Riley up in the upper right box. Say hello, Koki. How's it going? <laughs> and Wilson Alexander in the bottom box. Say hello, Wilson. Happy opening day to all. Who Happy op- For those who aren't watching, Perrin's wearing a throwback Montreal Expos hat. Uh, I don't know if that's an honor of opening day or not, but uh, we're just going to roll with it. Uh, Koki is a huge baseball fan. Obviously, it's not opening day for college baseball. We're well past that, but um, all, happy opening day to all who celebrate. I should have been wearing Braves gear, but their game got postponed to Friday. So, um, well, so what's on, today. In, all, in all seriousness, Wilson, what's on your head? Because I can't tell. Uh, just a master's hat. My hair was like a cockatoo this morning. Oh, so, uh, you know, had, had to just throw something on. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Should have been. Should be like an Atlanta Thrash. It's not opening day for hockey, but it should be like an Atlanta Thrashers. You got to go vintage. Uh, if you if it's not going to be a Braves hat. I went to exactly one Thrashers game in my life, and I got uh, a stomach ache from eating oh, sushi right. at the um, arena. So, but they arena went. sushi. <laughs> arena sushi evidently worse than gas station sushi. So who would have figured? Uh, <laughs> Let's uh, let's get this thing on the rails. I'm quite certain that uh, that our listeners and viewers did not come in to discuss Expos baseball and ballpark sushi. So let's get to it. Uh, a little bit of business, of course, as always. Uh, if you're if you're tuning in and you're listening, uh, you know that the Advocate's the number one destination for uh, LSU sports coverage. So please subscribe to the Advocate if you haven't already. Uh, go to theadvocate.com/slash subscribe. Uh, subscribe to our newsletter. There's a lot going on, as we always say, but it's it's always true, especially in the spring. Uh, really, basically every single major spring, major sport is going in the spring if you include football, which of course is why Wilson is here. Spring football is going on. We just had Pro Day. We'll get uh, get into that. And then, of course, baseball. The baseball team's got to get themselves uh, sort of turned around and square and right. Long way to go, but uh, they got a brutal schedule ahead starting this weekend with Arkansas. Stay up to date with everything. Gymnastics, uh, LSU women's basketball, softball, all that's going on as well. So get all your headlines uh, sent to one place so you don't have to go uh, scrambling all over the internet. Get get, get our uh, get our LSU newsletter uh, sent straight to your inbox, to your phone, to your desktop to sign up for it. You go to theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. Of course, we are here on the LSU Sports Insider every Monday and Thursday uh, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever the finer podcasts are found. Uh, but more, uh, perhaps more importantly, we're, uh, we're live on our YouTube channel. Uh, the YouTube channel, ten- excuse me, YouTube channel, LSU Tigers on NOLA.com. You can always catch us there live. If you don't catch us there live, you can catch us after the fact on that same YouTube channel. So check out, do a search for LSU Tigers on NOLA.com on YouTube and hit that subscribe button. And that way you will stay up to date on all our episodes. Incidentally, uh, if you are looking for a breakdown of the women's basketball uh, tournament and the big weekend coming up for them, you can check out our previous podcast. And also the first week of spring, first week, first major week of spring football in terms of Wilson being able to uh, uh, glean some observations from what's going on over there at practice. Uh, that was two episodes ago. So stay up to date and check out all our episodes at our YouTube channel, LSU Tigers on uh, And of course, we are brought to you uh, today and every day by Champion Wealth Strategies. Champion Wealth Strategies is a national financial services firm specializing in the capital markets, securities, insurance, 401ks, and college and retirement planning. Our broker-dealer is LPL Financial Member FINRA SIPC. As you know, investments are not FDIC insured, may lose value, and have no bank guarantee. Uh, but to, to, uh, to, uh, to learn more, to find out about Champion Wealth Strategies, please go, please go to championwealthstrategies.com. Uh, so let's let's start a, uh, a little bit with baseball first, uh, Koki. If you would, uh, you've seen uh, certainly some promising things from the LSU baseball team for the first two weekends. Even though they've dropped two out of three in their first two weekends, the first against Mississippi State, the second, of course, against Florida, they get run ruled uh, a couple of times, and so uh, it, it's interesting. It's interesting, uh, obviously, the situation they find themselves in, and it's not going to get any easier as we speak uh, here on Thursday, sort of mid. Midday Thursday, uh, the uh, the Tigers are gearing up for Arkansas and one of the best pitchers in the land and Hagen Smith. So they will have their hands full to be able to get going. And first first things first, uh, Koki, just tell us a little bit about the rotation and, and what J- how Jay Johnson is approaching this weekend. Yeah, they're uh, mixing things up a little bit this weekend. 
Um, Luke Holman will throw on Friday. He won't throw on Thursday, so we won't get the Luke Holman versus uh, Hagen Smith matchup to start the series. And then Gage Jump will start on Saturday. Uh, Thursday starter, uh, which is today's starter, still to be determined. So um, we'll see who uh, gets the ball. And if I had to make a guess, it's probably going to be Griffin Herring. Um, not 100% sure on that, though. Uh, could, maybe it's Javen Coleman. Uh, maybe it's Christian Little. Maybe it's Nate Ackenhausen. All of them have started for LSU at some point in their LSU ca- careers. Uh, Ackenhausen a little last season. Uh, Coleman three times this year. And Herring once early, uh, in, during the non-conference play. So um, we'll see how it all sort of shakes out. But uh, you know, Herring's been probably their best reliever up to, the, up to this point. And um, he'll be rested well enough for this game. And, and, and I think they can probably get three or four innings out of him if they needed to. Uh, so, you, you know, it's going to be a little bit more of a collective effort in this first game, I think, regardless. Um, but at the same time, like I can sort of understand why they're doing this because uh, it's going to be hard to win this first game against Hagen Smith because he's been probably the best pitcher in college baseball to start this year. This is also not the first time, nor will I, I, I doubt very seriously, it'll be the last time that Jay Johnson says his starting pitcher is TBA in a given time. This is, um, is this a little bit of uh, sort of Jay Johnson being Jay Johnson, a little bit of football coach in him where he, uh, he's got to have a little palace intrigue going on? Uh, um, yeah, I, I mean, he definitely thinks at least that it's an advantage for um, nobody to know who, it, for for him his team that you know Arkansas doesn't know who they're who they'll be facing, um, and maybe that could be just a, another slight edge that he can use uh, heading into a game where you know he was going to be undermanned in terms of the pitching side either way. So you know maybe you know, muddy the waters a little bit and see what happens. Uh, I, I want to bring up uh, two. Th- Two words, a phrase to you, uh, because this stood out. You obviously made note of it uh, in a story at the end of the week, end of last weekend. Uh, it's up at theadvocate.com if you want to catch up. Uh, competitive. Yeah, well, it is. It's a fine website, isn't it? <laughs> Lots of fine information. Beautiful people running around on that website. Uh, uh, the phrase competitive character, uh, which is something that Jay Johnson, he actually used those two words together. And what he was getting at with that and what he didn't see and would like to see uh, as LSU moves forward. And, and did he see a little bit of it, uh, albeit in a small sample size uh, against Southeastern uh, for the midweek game? Um, I don't think he saw it a ton in the Southeastern game just because um, LSU was pretty much ahead and they didn't run into a ton of uh, 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 high stress situations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, was, I, I totally forgot the word. Uh, and so, you know, they just, they, they're, they pretty much control the game throughout and it's really just a matter of when, you know, when bleep hits the fan, how do you react? And when bleep hit the fan on, on Sunday, uh, they didn't react very well to it at all. The, the game really just, just totally fell apart and, and, Re- um, we'll reset think- that for our listeners and readers. That, you know, for those who are just sort of catching up and they just sort of check in on LSU baseball, and may not have known how that how that series finale game. They they have a one run lead, and then what happens? Yeah, so they have one run lead, and then Thatcher Hurd gives up six runs in the top of the fifth inning. Um, actually, he didn't give up all six runs. We gave up five of the six runs in that top of the fifth inning, and uh, gives up a two run home run with one out. And then you know the beginning two out problem sort of started to happen and manifest for him after that um couldn't get out of the inning and then kate anderson gives up a two-run home run to you know score the last inherited runner and um add, add that sixth run to the board and then after that it was just a non-slot of um florida home runs whether it was another one off anderson um whether it was a couple off uh javen coleman in uh, two innings later and the offense basically shut down as well uh, with the exception of a Jared Jones home run. And before you know it, it was a 12 to two run rolled game. And um, given how South things went and how quickly they went. And, uh, and I haven't even mentioned the fact that Jay Johnson got ejected um, during this entire <laughs> <That's true. laughs> yeah. foray as well. And that was the first time he's been ejected at LSU. Um, given how quickly things just sort of fell apart for them. Um, it, it made sense that he went to, uh, 
how it made sense how disappointed he was in the I guess the competitive character and the resilience, the lack of resilience they had in that game. Uh, so what would you like to see? Well, before we get into uh, to Arkansas, get more into Arkansas uh, here just in a little bit, you do want to bring up uh, a certain somebody who who has flashed uh, and did flash this past weekend, a uh, young man by the name of Ethan Fry, who uh, who did well uh, right-handed hitter, particularly against lefties, which is not a surprise, righty-lefty, but uh, he, he particularly stood out. Yeah, this has been a, tr- a trend with Ethan um, so far this season. Uh, if you remember the South, the first time they played Southeastern this season in Hammond, um, when they were when they came back from a three to one deficit with two outs in the ninth inning, uh, Fry came in the pinch hit and it was against a left-handed hitter, and he had a double and it kept the inning going, and they ended up winning the game. Um, and then in the Xavier game where he got ended up getting hurt, he he started and it was against a left-handed pitcher. And then when he came back from injury this past weekend, um, uh, he started two of the three games against Florida and and Florida has two left-handed pitchers, you know, starting in their rotation and Cade Fisher and Jack Caglione. He starts both those games. He gets at least, he gets one hit against Caglione and he gets two hits um, against Cade Fisher. So you're kind of seeing a trend here and you're kind of, you're not only seeing a trend here in terms of who he's starting against and when it's he's producing. So um, I, I think Fry has become definitely like a very dangerous option for them against left-handed pitching. Um, and uh, I'm not saying he's, you know, terrible against right-handed pitching. He'll never play against right-handed pitching, but they had him lead off uh, uh, during the midweek game against Southeastern, you know, this past week. Uh, and it was against a righty and he didn't get a hit. Um, I just feel like that's notable, uh, uh, worth noting, I should say. Um, and, so, so yeah, like I, I think he's definitely a weapon for them against left-handed pitching, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if he started in, in this game against Hagen Smith tonight. Uh, Ethan Fry on the season, uh, not not just versus uh, not just versus left-handers, but uh, his, his his overall stats. He's played in thirteen of the twenty-six games LSU has played, hitting three twenty-one and twenty-eight at bats. Uh, somebody who is. Uh, not hitting for quite the average, but has certainly made his mark. Certainly left a mark on several baseballs as of late. Jared Jones hitting 289. He's already got 10 home runs on the year. Uh, he's uh, he is uh, he's certainly made his presence felt uh, lately. Yeah, uh, Jared's really improved his plate discipline and his ability to sort of uh, lay off of those breaking balls that he was chasing at. You know, it really even in the beginning of this season. Um, I think right now he leads the team in walks. I think that's where you really see that patient approach. And when he's swinging the bat, he's hitting the ball hard. Um, sometimes it's right at guys, sometimes right at outfielders, but you know, sometimes it's going over the fence as well. At least the team in home runs with 10. So um, that, I, I guess that patient approach, that ability to maximize his contact, he's done a really, really good job of that uh, over the last few weeks in particular. So I, I, I think at the very beginning of the year, I said that uh, Brady Neal, Jared Jones and Paxton Kling, like their progress was going to be like huge for this offense and going to be sort of the key to unlocking the rest of the offense. So far, they have one of the three guys who have have certainly proven that they've done that so far this year in Jared. So uh, it's whether you can get those other two guys up to speed, particularly against conference play. uh, That's going to be a real key for them moving forward. So moving forward, uh, as we stand here today, uh, before the Thursday night opener uh, at Alec Box, LSU, of course, is two and four in conference play. Uh, this is <laughs> they uh, they're two and four in conference play, and they've got quite the they've got a, a good bit of the not that the SEC is ever an easy trip, uh, no matter where you go, but uh, they've got they've got Vanderbilt coming up next week, followed by Tennessee, and then they go to Missouri. And Missouri, of course, out of those three upcoming opponents, is probably the at least on paper, the weakest of, of these opponents. And of course, Arkansas, number one team in the nation and Hagan Smith, who they've, they've faced before, of course, and Dave Van Horn's been doing it a long time. Hagan Smith uh, this year, though, 4-0, 1.24 ERA. Uh, we're talking about 62, 62 strikeouts against 10 walks. This is going to be a difficult assignment. I don't care who you are. Uh, just tell, tell us what you're expecting uh, to see out of Hagan Smith, what fans should expect to see out of Hagan Smith and how else she's going to try to combat these guys. Yeah, with Hagen Smith expect to see, you know, one of, if not the best uh, pitchers in college baseball. You're expecting a guy who could potentially be a top 10 pick in this upcoming year's draft. 
Um, I'm not saying he is Paul Skeens, but he's this year's Paul Skeens. I guess right. that's sort of the best way to put it. And um, I, I think it does make sense for you know LSU to sort of save their bullets for the later, the latter half of the series. Even though I do think Mesa Molina and Brady Tigart aren't that much worse than Hagen Smith. I, I mean, Arkansas's rotation has just been the best rotation in college baseball so far this season. Um, their offense, I, I think, is. I think they can limit their offense. Um, maybe not. Uh, I, I like Arkansas's offense isn't you know a weakness compared to you know most teams uh, to to like most teams. But at the same time, I wouldn't call it like the team strike necessarily. It's a very old team, a lot of transfers. Um, Kendall Diggs is a uh, is a name who's been there for a while and a very productive player. But uh, it's it's you know it, it's something that I think LSU starters at least can handle. Um, whether the bullpen can handle them may, you know, determine whether this team wins two games or or one game or none um, this weekend. So uh, that's certainly something to look to, to look look out for as we uh, move ahead into this weekend. So you mentioned the bullpen and the bullpen having difficulties. We we've discussed over and over and over again, uh, as as all our listeners and and uh, and viewers know, that this this LSU baseball team was always going to be. Uh, a little bit of a flip in terms of its identity compared to last year, where it's going to be, you know, it, it will, it is supposed to be reliant on its pitching staff, which appears to be very strong in the rotation and appears to be very deep and talented coming out of the bullpen with lots of options. Uh, but frankly, lately the bullpen has struggled. Uh, Thatcher Hurd certainly uh, ran into some trouble as a starting pitcher uh, in the series finale against. Uh, against uh, Florida couldn't get out of the inning bullpen comes in does not do a whole lot better what's going on with the bullpen uh Koki that's a that's a short question with a long answer <laughs> but what do you suspect is going on with the bullpen uh is this just one of these things that happens in baseball you go through a really you know you're going through a, you're going through it you're going through a rough patch and so many of them are going through it at the same time uh, what's what's sort of the remedy for these guys and how they sort of get back right to more toward you know, where they were at the beginning of the season, albeit against a uh, weaker competition and non-conference. What, what do they, what do they do? I think what we've seen with the starting rotation and sort of mixing it up a little bit, maybe even having Thatcher heard as a reliever. I think that might be one path that they, they, they may be going down. Um, because if you look at next week too, that sort of sets them up to where, they play a Thursday to Saturday series next weekend as well. So um, I don't know how Thatcher's going to slide in there if that's going to be the case, unless they have him start, have they, they just like sit him throughout this week or maybe have him just come out of relief once and then start on Thursday, next Thursday, maybe. Um, but uh, maybe that's uh, one way that's one like as Avenue of, of a solution there. Um, but then again, either way, you're, t you're plucking somebody out of that bullpen and then starting them on Thursday right this Thursday. So um, I, I think Griffin Herring has been a strength for them, but really with everyone else, I can at least pick some nits as to, and, and sort of, um, you know, find some holes, whether it's in their game or their approaches or the way Jay Johnson handled them. I mean, Nate Ackenhausen, I think on Saturday in that huge game um, that really determined whether LSU would be two and four in SEC play or three and three in SEC play um, on Saturday, they were the better team through six or seven innings. They had a two run lead. Yep. Um, then the eighth inning, there was a drop third strike it, with runners in the corners and two outs. And um, the Cade Curlin, he reached base on the drop third strike. And that would have ended the inning. And Akinhaus had to get four outs in that inning and uh, run scored because of it. And that was massive because in the next inning, you know, uh, Akinhaus walks the leadoff batter and uh, Florida scores with two outs in that ninth inning to send the game the extra innings. It was absolutely crushing for the fans in attendance, everybody. I mean, it was the second. Uh, second highest paid attendance in LSU baseball history in that game. It was a it was a raucous environment, and they just couldn't quite uh, slam the door on Florida. And it was that was really crushing for them. Uh, and it leaked into Sunday, of course, because of all the stuff that happened to them on that Sunday. So, I, and I think a lot of fans would argue that they shouldn't have let Ackenhausen, you know, throw the tenth and eleventh innings of that game just because it was going to be hard for him to. Uh, get through Florida's lineup once, let alone twice, right? And he faced Caglione a second time. And when he faced him a second time, Caglione hit a Made ball. Him yes, exactly. Hit a ball. Hit, yeah, hit a ball over the over the wall and uh, two run home run, which ended up deciding the game. So, um, 
yeah, so I, I you could point to maybe some of the bullpen management. You can point to, you know, just guys underperforming. Um, uh, I mean, last weekend against uh, Mississippi State, they walked a lot of guys. I think they walked 10 guys in 11 and the third innings or something like that, which is just kind of unacceptable. Um, they gave up a ton of home runs, five to be exact. Uh, the bullpen did um, against Florida on Sunday alone. Uh, that's just far too many. And I think that's what kind of helped inflate their ERA to even higher lengths because on the sat on the Friday against uh, the Gators, they threw pretty well because it was just one guy. It was Griffin Herring, three innings, three shout out inning, innings. Um, Gavin Gidry had a solid start. Uh, not perfect because he gave the lead off double, which became the, the, the run that cut the lead to one in that Saturday game. But for the most part, he's been pretty solid for them. Um, and then we talked about Nate extensively, but then after that, it, you know, it just was a lot of guys that I don't know how much confidence LSU fans have in them right now. And those guys have to pitch better, whether it's throwing strikes or limiting home runs. Um, and you know, and I, I mean, Sundays are Sundays. There's cause there's going to be more runs scored. Like part of this is on the offense right. as well. No, no matter, um, no matter who you're talking about. Sunday exactly. Yeah. Like is... Sundays are the days where you're supposed to score runs and right. they haven't done that at all on, on both Sundays. So it's not maybe all in the bullpen. Um, and it's not maybe all in those guys, because again, I, I mentioned the Jay Johnson, you know, how he's handled those guys. So uh, I, I have a big story on just sort of breaking down everything that's sort of gone on with this bullpen. Uh, that's probably up on the advocate right now. Uh, so, but I, I think just to distill it all and, and like the bottom line of it all is they have to pitch better. And right now I think they have a 10.5 ERA in 23 innings, uh, the bullpen against SEC competition. That's just not going to do it. Um, even if you do include some of the mismanagement and, um, some of the bad luck, whether it's the Ackenhausen play or some batted ball luck. Right. Uh, but at the same time, like it's, it's just got to improve because, you know, this team's built off their pitching, as we mentioned earlier. You know, the offense is going to be up and down throughout the rest of the season, really. So the pitching was going to be the stabling force. And right now it hasn't been a stabling force at the back end. Uh, before we move on to uh, f- spring football and pro day, one last thing about baseball that we probably ought to talk about a little bit, at least. Uh, there, st- con- speaking of tinkering, uh, some tinkering continues in the outfield. Paxton Kling starts in center. Uh, the first and the last game of the Florida series. He came, he was on the bench on Saturday, came off the bench. Uh, Brady Neal starts in right field in the last game of the series. Uh, that puts Josh Pearson at second base, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, mm-hmm. And then Jake Brown was in center field in the middle, in the middle game. Jake Brown, obviously doing, doing a job at the plate. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Mac Bingham, uh, he does okay. Uh, had a couple of hits on Friday. He had a homer on Saturday uh, and Pearson did a, uh, pretty well himself. This is still, you know, a con- this is all a continuation of the mixing and matching that Jay Johnson has been doing in the outfield. And uh, maybe we'll see this all season, but maybe he'll, he, he will find uh, a combination that he really likes. Just give us your two cents on what's going on there in the outfield. Kofi. Yeah. I, I think Paxton's struggles um, at the plate have sort of opened up and have sort of continued the third outfielder roulette that they've been having lately. Um, I think Josh Pearson and, and uh, Mac Bingham have pretty much established themselves as, every, as everyday guys, whether it's in the outfield or not. Um, and then Steven Milam's been kind of thrown to this mix as well because he's had trouble hitting against conference pitching, uh, SEC pitching. So uh, sometimes they'll move him back. They, they moved him back to second base on Sunday, for example. So, uh, so I mean, technically it's a second base and outfield roulette a little bit. Right. But really it's a third outfielder, um, you know, relay so uh we'll see you know jake brown is in that mix um maybe if ethan fry can rehab his shoulder enough because i didn't even mention this in the ethan fry portion but he's been playing with a bad shoulder um so maybe he can get in there a little bit i mean ashton larson if if the matchups um sort of help him out a little bit more on that because he's a left-handed hitter and they can face a couple more righties then maybe he's an option um uh, so yeah, like they have a bunch of different you know guys that um, are sort of vying for an outfield spot, and um, whether it's Bingham in center, and then they moved uh, move uh, one of the guys to the corners, or Brady Neal to right field, and you know Josh Pearson to the left, or something something along those lines. Um, that's something that they don't that, that they've done quite a bit. 
as well, put, putting Brady Neal in the outfield. So, it, it, you know, that all depends on the matchup, really. Um, I, I don't think, you know, Johnson's sitting a guy uh, unless it's, you know, the cling situation because he's struggling at the plate so much. Um, I don't think he's sitting a guy because, you know, he's, he's out of favor, right? I think it's because of matchup. Right. It's always about the matchups with him. That's what you have to remember. Um, it's why they don't really have a set bullpen. It's why they don't really have a set lineup. Um, and sometimes it's not even why they have a set rotation. Uh, so uh, that, that's something definitely to keep in mind as we head into this series. And um, it's why I, I, I kind of think Fry will, might get some even some even more playing time against an Arkansas team that, of course, is Hagen Smith and a few other pretty good lefties. This is the LSU Sports Insider brought to you by the journalists at The Advocate, NOLA.com, and the Times picking you. You know where to find all these uh, fine gentlemen's fine work. Uh, that's at TheAdvocate.com. It's a great web- website, as uh, Wilson alluded to earlier before. So you, so you go there for the time of your life, uh, and you certainly go there for the uh, the best uh, LSU sports coverage of anybody around. Uh, and so if you don't if you don't subscribe already, please do support your local journalists. Uh, you know, we uh, the Advocate's always been known as the number one destination. We cover LSU wall to wall. Uh, and so, uh, you know, don't miss a don't miss a moment. Get all the uh, news and the latest headlines sent straight to your inbox, to your phone, to your desktop uh, with the LSU newsletter. Uh, uh, Scott Rabelais handles that three times a week, but it's a daily newsletter sent straight to your email. And so uh, you can sign up for that and you won't miss a moment there either. You won't miss all the headlines, all the latest uh, sign up at the advocate.com slash LSU newsletter. We are here every Monday and Thursday on the LSU Sports Insider on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever the finer podcasts are found. And of course, uh, perhaps more importantly, we are, uh, uh, we, whether we're in the studio or doing this virtually as we are today, uh, we are here uh, every Monday and Thursday on our YouTube channel, uh, LSU Tigers on NOLA.com. If you uh, go onto YouTube and search LSU Tigers on NOLA.com, you should be able to find us and you will be able to find us there live whenever we go live on Mondays and Thursdays. If you don't catch us there live, you can catch us on that same YouTube channel after the fact. So please sign up for that as well. Uh, And of course, we are brought to you every Monday and Thursday by Champion Wealth Strategies. To learn more about those fine folks, go to championwealthstrategies.com and plan like a champion today. Uh, So speaking of champions or uh, certainly people who have performed like champions lately, uh, let's talk a little bit about Wilson, about Malik Neighbors. Uh, I thought you were going to say me, but okay. Well, I, I don't know. I don't, how'd you play? How was your golf game lately? Yeah. It's gotten better. Huh? But yes, Malik Neighbors had a fantastic pro day. Uh, I think that's a little birdie says before I cut you off there. Um, no, a little birdie says your 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 short game is not champion champion level. Rabs ratting me out over there. I see how it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're working on it. We're you know it's gotten better. That's good. Um, yeah, it's got, it's, we're working on it. But um. Malik, yes, at Pro Day, uh, to get back on track here, he really shined. You know, going into this, it was already uh, pretty obvious that Malik is going to be a top 10 pick. If he fell out of that, it would be shocking come draft night. Um, really, I, I think it probably maybe a top six pick. And he, I think, solidified that with what he did at Pro Day. A 42-inch vertical jump, a 10-foot, 9-inch broad jump, and a 4.35 40-yard dash. And then, of course, did everything that you expect of Malik in the, during the throwing session as well crisp routes, varied routes. It, Brian Kelly said, this validated what you see on film uh, and his ability to separate from other players, you know, from corners and DBs uh, when he's running his routes and then his ability to pick up yards after the catch. All of it goes back to his explosiveness and just, you know, really shows that in those numbers, how explosive of a player he is. You see comments from NFL draft analysts um, who have done this for a long time, um, calling him the most explosive player uh, in this draft class, potentially, uh, there, that view is certainly out there. I, I just wanted to say something right quick, Wilson. I I, I want to put you guys on the hot seat. Do you guys know what the average vertical jump is, or what's sort of considered the mean, the median vertical jump is for an NBA player? Oh my gosh, I do not know. I'm going to go with 33 inches. Koki, 37, 38. The oh, wow. average vertical <laughs> jump. The average vertical jump or the mean vertical jump for an N- for an NBA player is 28 inches. Mm. You want to give you want to give Malik Neighbors his number again one more time. 42, <laughs> uh, which would have been uh, I think it was the would have been the second highest at the tied for second highest at the combine. There was a few guys who uh, hit 42 and a half inches, um, but this is also coming from somebody who's six feet, like pretty That's much six right. feet flat, and right. um, he he can really get up there. 
Um, it goes back to, it reminds me of a story that one of his former high school coaches told me about how he was as a basketball player. Malik could just dunk flat footed. I mean, he's just gets so much um, leap out of his lower body and so much explosiveness. It, it, that's the word that I keep coming back to with him. I, that a lot of people see with him when you evaluate his game, you could really tell in his yards after the catch last year, how much he's able to pick up once he has the ball in his hands. And, you know, he hadn't tested at the combine. He hadn't been measured at the combine. He really waited to do everything at pro day. And he took full advantage of it. So, Perrin, you're telling me he should be in the dunk contest? Is that what you're telling me? If he wants to be, you know, they could <laughs> sign him up like Matt McQuang. I mean, they could do a gracious. fantastic dunk contest with, like, LSU's football players. Um, <laughs> you know, would it compare to, like, what you could, would get out of LSU's basketball team? No, probably not. But you talk, like, if, like, especially from – some names that come to mind, like Trey Des Green, if you got him involved once he got on campus, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. six foot seven, tight end with a basketball background. Brian Thomas was a basketball player pretty much his entire life and jump over the rim. Malik as well. I think you could get some interesting results. They probably, you know, would they, would they do it necessarily? Uh, maybe not. I don't think their agents injury, are going to be but, too keen on it right yeah, before exactly. draft. I'll but tell like, you that. that <laughs> exactly. I mean, it has but to it be better be than a fantastic site. It has to be better than the NBA slam dunk contest. That's all I got to say. So, <laughs> it would, well, I think it would be more entertaining, frankly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It's got to be better than that. So, but it, you know, it is the bar is low. <laughs> in, all, in all seriousness, it, it is just a, gr- a reminder just how in- insanely good these, these guys are and how insanely good elite, not to get too far sidetracked, but how, how insane elite athletes truly are. Uh, we, we mentioned golf, which we never mentioned on the show, really. But, uh, and Wilson, you talked about, we we're talking about your game. And I just the thing that really brings it into focus of me is just about how good the very best in anything are is uh, you remember the uh, uh, it's called, it used to be called the tight lies tour, but now it's called the Adams tour. This is very, very, very sort it would be sort of like low A uh, if you were going to use minor leagues as an example. And they used to come through here and play the university club, do a weekend event. And these guys would shoot something like, I mean, they, you know, the winner would be something like 35 under or something like that, but they're just tearing up this course. And these are guys who are never, never, ever, ever going to sniff the PGA tour. I mean, these are the best of the best of the best of the best. So uh, just find that, you know, it's, it's a reminder of just how good the, the elite, the elite athletes are uh, anywhere you go and whatever you see. Uh, let's move on to uh, Brian Thomas. Speaking of elite, he had a nice little 40 time that he turned in, didn't he? Well, yeah, I mean, that was at, you know, the combine. Uh, he had the 4 3 Oh, that's Brian right. Yeah, you're test. right. At all yesterday, uh, somebody asked him afterwards why he didn't work out, and he goes, I did everything at the combine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, he stood on his combine numbers because why yep. wouldn't you when you test the way he did? He was one of the most impressive receivers and overall players at the combine about a month ago. And so, you know, he participated in the throwing session with Jaden Malik and some of LSU's other uh, current receivers, uh, too. Um, you know, had actually one of the highlights of the day, it was kind of subtle during the throwing session. Um, if you don't have a keen eye for it, that all kind of starts to blend together um, in some ways. Um, but Brian had this great vertical route down the field where he brought in a, a long uh, deep throw uh, from Jaden down the right sideline with his fingertips. Um, that really caught the eye of some evaluators. And uh, just further emphasize that he is a, a top 15 pick most likely. Maybe he gets up as high as 12. Um, would he drop past 15? It's possible depending on how the draft shakes out. But he's certainly in that range. He's going to be a first round pick. Um, and, uh, you, you know, he, he brings so much to the table, um, you know, not just as a vertical player, but, you know, he was showing some different routes yesterday that emphasize that he can do a little bit more than just be that. That certainly seems to be the strength of his game. But, you know, he, after what he did at Pro Day uh, in terms of, like I said, in the throwing session on top of his combine and what, all of the film that he had last year, he solidified himself just like Malik did uh, as one of the top players in this class. So certainly from the wide receiver position. Yeah, it, it seems like it's it's um, Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze, and Malik Neighbors is kind of like a tier top three, and then it's Brian. I, I mean, that's what it sort of seems like at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I would certainly agree with that. And right now it's whether or not Malik is one or two. You know, maybe some other teams have Rome at two. Um, it all is in the eye of the beholder. Um, but there it appears to be momentum – uh, that Malik it could even be the first receiver off the board. Um, it seems almost, again, fa- unfathomable because there's been just so much hype around Marvin Harrison Jr. for over a year, and deservedly so. Marvin Harrison mm-hmm. is a fantastic player. We got into this a lot when we were talking about the Bolitnikoff Award last season. This isn't really to take away from either one of them, um, but you again see from draft analyst folks who really cover the draft closely um, that there's 
some teams that have Malik Neighbors as their number one wide receiver. And there's even some that have him, according to Dane Brugler of The Athletic, as their, as their like, top prospect on the entire draft. Um, and so, you know, Malik, uh, I think there was a lot of the conversation coming off yesterday is, oh, can he be wide receiver one? He's certainly in that mix. I mean, he had a fantastic year last year, back-to-back thousand-yard seasons, uh, you know, Blitnikoff finalist and everything that we saw at Pro Day. Uh, just further back that up that I agree with you. He's certainly in that top tier. Uh, along with Marvin and with Rome. Um, but it feels like it's probably even a tier that's maybe just Marvin and uh, Malik. And um, mm-hmm. can Malik jump Marvin Harrison and be the first receiver off the board? We'll have to see. He talked about that just a little bit yesterday, that in his mind, he's wide receiver one, even if he gets drafted at 19. Um, that's just kind of the mentality that he has and that he's going to maintain throughout his career. He was <laughs> he To really speak to Malik's mindset, he said that he woke up at 5 a.m. yesterday, not because he had set an alarm, but because he was anxious and it's sort of anticipating running the 40. It was something he hadn't officially done since high school. His legs were even shaking a little bit as he was kind of waking up uh, in anticipation for that event. He said that he ran it a second time after having got hit 4.35 unofficially uh, because he had seen somewhere in the media, didn't say where this came from. I don't know who said this, <laughs> that he was a 4.5 or 4.6 guy. And he wanted to prove that and showcase that what he really is, is in that guy who's a 4.3 to 4.4. And again, no clue where that came from. Might just be one of those kind of athletes who manufactures chips on their shoulder. Cause that was a phrase that he used quite a bit yesterday was having a chip on his shoulder. He wants to prove that he's the best wide receiver out there. That's certainly how he th- views himself. It's it, there was that, that quote was making the rounds on social media as, you know, the many classic manufactured chip on the shoulder sort of, you know, comment, you know, the Michael Jordan thing where he's you know, just coming up with, uh, you know, reasons out of thin air to uh, be motivated on a single day. Right. Like it's a, it's a very similar thing. And it's a, uh, it's kind of funny to look at from the outside, but it's also very smart um, uh, for a, a, any athlete and especially for a guy like Malik to sort of do that with himself. It seems to be uh, effective for that that certain type of, you know, that athlete with that certain type of personality. For what it's worth, CBS Sports, the latest mock, uh, has Malik Neighbors going sixth, as does Mel Kuyper of ESPN. The lowest I can find anywhere is him going ninth, uh, which does bring into question, where do we think uh, that uh, one number five might go? Jaden Daniels, he uh, obviously threw passes yesterday wearing a very specific sweatshirt, uh, which I thought was a nice touch. Uh, incidentally, but, um, you know, we see, we see other quarterbacks who, um, and look, this is, this happens every year, all the way across the board, across every position and all that. Uh, but certainly, uh, a players, quarterbacks who, uh, you know, frankly did not uh, accomplish as much last year or in their college careers as Jaden Daniels did. Uh, where does he stand now? Uh, what did he, uh, what did he, uh, what do well, what do we think about all this? Wilson, go, go ahead. Jaden, you know, only through yesterday, there was really no reason for him to test as much as we would have loved to have seen Jaden run the 40, just to know what the time is. This is a guy who (laughs) verified 21 plus miles an hour in multiple games last year. Another guy who could just be another guy who could just point to the tape and say, I've I've put enough on film. You guys go ahead and take a look at that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Exactly. He still took measurements. That was something that he and Malik had not done at the combine. So teams got his height, weight, hand size, arm length, et cetera. Uh, A quick note about Malik speaking of hand size. Nine and seven eighths, which is the same as Brian Thomas, even though Brian Thomas is three inches taller. Malik wears wow. four XL gloves. <laughs> it's just <laughs> wild. His hands are absolutely <laughs> massive, especially for a guy six feet tall. But back to Jaden. Um, you know, he just did the throwing session, like I said. And, you know, it, he missed some throws here and there, uh, overthrew his receivers a couple times. Uh, it really seemed to settle in, though, toward the end, hit some impressive deep balls, one in particular to Chris Hilton as the media was kind of walking out toward the interview room that was like a 65 yard kind of throw and it emphasized how effective he was throwing the deep ball last year. You know, that throw day, that the throwing session probably isn't going to dictate exactly what teams do at the top of the draft, unless it's absolutely abysmal or overly impressive. Um, Jaden really, you just point to his film last year, like you said, and the, what, what he did want to do yesterday though, was show a few different things that we didn't see from his uh, senior year at LSU. He took a few plays under center, which is something that LSU never did. Uh, and did, you know, fake handoffs play action. Again, not something that LSU did from under center last year with him at all. 
And then he also wanted to do some off-platform stuff, which we saw a little bit from him. But that was kind of the main uh, focus of his throwing session, which uh, had been designed by his personal quarterbacks coach, Taylor Kelly, out there at 3DQB, who was running that for him yesterday. And he wanted to show that regardless of kind of whether he was in the pocket or throwing off-platform, uh, that he could get his feet back underneath them and kind of show his footwork. And so he thought he accomplished that. Um, and Jaden is still coming out of that pro day. You know, he did most likely either the second or the third pick of the draft. Um, there's a very strong chance that he ends up going number two to the Washington Commanders. Washington Commanders coach Dan Quinn was standing right behind Jaden throughout his throwing session. The Commanders had a strong contingent there, as did the Patriots at number three. Their senior offensive analyst, Ben McAdoo, was standing right behind Jaden. And even the Vikings quarterbacks coach, Josh McCown, the Vikings are another quarterback needy team, uh, that he was standing right behind him. Antonio Pierce, who Jaden has known for a long time, uh, actually coached him at Arizona State, head coach of the Raiders now. He was there, as was the head coach of the Saints, Dennis Allen, and the head coach of the, it is suddenly escaping me, uh, Bears, um, was there too. And it looks like the Bears are going to draft Caleb Williams. But, hmm. um, you know, they still had some people there checking out Jaden as they do the rest of their homework. Uh, Jaden is in that upper echelon of players this year. He's probably going to go second or third, and it just depends on how things shake out a month from now in Cleveland. I think the the Patriots and the Commanders had their entire brass there. At, you know, head coach, you know, the GM, the, the you know, head head of pro scouting, you know, all the way, all the way down. And I think they're all going to make their way to North Carolina, or they've made their way to North Carolina already for today for uh, Drake May's pro day. So um, it it all just it, you know it all just makes sense. And then another thing to add to it was uh, reportedly Jaden hadn't really started his meetings at all. And that really came uh, kind of started here around pro day. And so that might've even been more important uh, to some of these teams than just watching him throw on air um, because then they could actually get in rooms with him. You know, it certainly I would imagine some of that happened at the combine, but you know, more of an individual thing, further evaluation in this process, just getting to sit down and talk with him. Uh, that was happening around pro day as well. And uh, that was a big reason for teams to come down too. Uh, elsewhere, uh, there uh, obviously <laughs> these these two uh, folks who we were talking about were not were far from the only ones who uh, who were uh, participating in pro day. You know, so many of these you saw. Uh, uh, Lewis Riddick was among you know many 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 personalities who you know just sort of made broad general statements about like the, you know, the talent level is incredible here at LSU. Uh, and so that and that in and of itself is not a surprise. But I did want to because you had a story that's up today or has been up for a couple of days now at uh, theadvocate.com about, uh, you know, something somebody who is something of a curious entry into the NFL draft. And that's Mason Smith. You had a chance to be able to talk to him, uh, you know, probably a projected maybe, you know, second day or excuse me you know, mid mid round, third or fourth round type of guy. Uh, but certainly, you know, was as coveted a prospect as there's been uh, over the last several years uh, in the state of Louisiana. He, uh, he was able to uh, just sort of discuss why he made the decision he did and uh, tell us about how, how well he did and, you know, what, what the prospects are for him uh, moving forward. Well, Mason, I didn't get to speak with him directly. He spoke at the Combine last month, so I do want to make that I distinction. I apologize. Because That's my mistake. He, he said at the Combine how he left LSU early, in large part because of the uncertainty around who was going to be the next defensive line coach. He had played under a different defensive line coach every single season at LSU, um, and there was still that uncertainty uh, when he was making his decision to declare. Pete Jenkins, who I did get the chance to speak to, was LSU's defensive line coach last year, kind of stepped in midseason and was in communication with Mason Smith during this process, even encouraged him to come back to LSU. Uh, but Pete, you know, said how he couldn't guarantee who the next defensive line coach was going to be. LSU was obviously at that time pursuing Bo Davis, but Bo Davis is not taking the job yet. Mason ends up going ahead and announcing that he's going to enter the NFL draft on January 9th. That's one day before LSU hires Bo Davis. But it was also six days before the underclassmen draft uh, de declaration deadline. Um, and that's a, the reason I wanted to say, like, really uh, specify that I didn't get to speak to Mason personally, because there were still some questions about, well, why not just wait a little bit longer if you had the choice to? Um, Pete said that in his gut, he just kind of felt like Mason was going to go. Uh, you know, clearly the feedback that he got was good enough for him to feel comfortable doing so at this time. And there's, he's still now a very intriguing prospect uh, for a lot of NFL teams because this is a guy who's still six foot six, 305 to 10 pounds in athletic and the five, the five-star prospect who signed with LSU a few years ago. 
Mason didn't really quite meet those expectations during his career. Part of it was the ACL injury that he couldn't control. It seemed like going into that 2022 season, uh, he had the chance to be really, truly dominant. LSU was having trouble blocking him throughout preseason camp. Um, but he didn't, you know, coming off that ACL for the first year, he didn't quite have the season that anyone thought he might. He didn't, you know, rise back up to that round one buzz that he was getting. But he did still feel like in his own mind that near the end of the season, he was starting to play a lot better. And he wanted to kind of build on that going now into the draft. And so Mason yesterday, you know, you saw him and Mikai Wingo and Jordan Jefferson all working out. None of his numbers necessarily like popped out at you or anything like that. Um, so I'm not sure necessarily what his pro day did or did not do for his stock. Um, whereas I think for like Mikhail Wingo, it probably continued to help. Um, his get off is so impressive. Um, his just short burst of quickness, um, which you can see on film, was evident again at pro day, just like it was at times at the combine. Jordan Jefferson, you got a sense of his strength and even some of his athleticism and speed. Uh, Mason didn't necessarily stand out in those ways. Um, but I think still probably impressed teams because of his size and the way that he is able to move still as a six foot six, like we said, uh, defensive lineman. And so, you know, that's kind of where Mason is at right now is probably still a maybe late day two pick, uh, maybe somewhere on day three. It kind of depends on if a team thinks that it can really get more out of him um, right. because there is still seems like there's a lot of potential within Mason Smith, but he needs to, he himself needs to be able to unlock it. And he probably needs the consistent coaching to help unlock it as well. Part of the reason that he left LSU, he said, was because of that uncertainty around another defensive line coach hire that had not been made at the time of his announcement. Maybe as he goes into the NFL, he can find some coaching, a little bit more stability in that regard, and maybe that'll help him unlock his talent too. And you mentioned like this Go year's ahead. defensive line class is the greatest defensive line class of all time. So um, I think because of that, that and because Definitely. of his background as a five-star recruit, and there's not a lot of, you know, five-star recruits aren't, there's, there's not a hundred of them out there in the draft. Right. So uh, because of those sort of accolades and, you know, the second year coming off an ACL is, is usually uh, when a player gets their full explosiveness back. Um, combine all those factors sort of together and, you know, maybe he gets drafted higher than some people expect him to. Uh, you mentioned uh, Makai Wingo, the, his departure, obviously, and the departure of Mason Smith. That, that's, that's, those were the two departures that left a big, huge hole at defensive tackle. Incidentally, nobody's, in, in addition to the explosiveness that Makai showed on pro day, nobody's going to question his motor uh, because this is, he, you know, as we did, as we saw for two years, he, you know, barely, barely came off the field the first year. Didn't, he came off the field a little bit more often uh, last year, but certainly, Certainly, uh, nobody's going to question his motor or his uh, his level of production. So, uh, good on him. That does leave a hole on the defensive line, um, and we all have always suspected that this offseason that would be uh, LSU's priority number one would be to find somebody in the transfer portal. They have found a defensive lineman, maybe not the uh, splashiest pickup, uh, but tell us a little about uh, Wilson about Wisconsin defensive end Gio Paez, who committed to LSU just the other day. Gio was, like you said, listed as a defensive end at Wisconsin, but this is somebody who is over 300 pounds and is going to be a defensive tackle at LSU. Uh, he is, you know, the first transfer pickup that they have on the defensive line. He said the other day that kind of, a, he, you know, he couldn't remember exactly the day that he entered the portal because as a graduate transfer, it's a little bit different. You can kind of do it whenever. It's not necessarily within those portal windows that we talk about a lot nowadays in college football. Uh, but pretty much as soon as he did, Bo Davis reached out. Um, so certainly, you know, after LSU had hired Bo Davis, LSU like, is in the market for at least one defensive tackle. I would be surprised if it's not at least one more, um, maybe even two come the spring portal window, depending on how, how the roster shakes out, who enters, all those sorts of things. Um, the spring portal window could be absolutely chaotic uh, here in April, um, at least much more so than it has been in the past. And so maybe there'll be opportunities to find some of those top defensive interior linemen um, for LSU. But for now, yeah, Gio Paez, a guy who's uh, going to be in his sixth year of college football. Uh, he didn't really play a whole lot for Wisconsin until the last couple of seasons. Uh, but last year he played in 13 games with six starts, and he made, I think, a career high around 23 tackles. I uh, also had a couple of quarterback hurries. You know, this is someone who, you know, Bo Davis clearly uh, believes in, this, the staff clearly believes in. This is a guy who's coming in on scholarship. It's not like he's preferred walk-on or anything. Uh, this is one of the, you know, as they're making, you know, additions to the de to this defensive line, this is someone who 
um, is, uh, is important in this whole equation. Um, like you said, maybe didn't make the splash, but it certainly matters as we talk about the defensive line moving forward. Um, as a six-year senior, he's going to be have a chance to come in and compete, and we'll see what he's able to do come preseason camp. It's not like he's going to come here in the middle of, of spring ball. It won't be a mid-semester edition or anything like that. So um, when preseason camp rolls around, we'll get a better sense of how he fits into the equation, but he's definitely going to be expected to be a piece of what LSU is doing next season when you bring in a guy who's got one more year of eligibility. So uh, L- L- we've gotten, uh, we've, we've discussed LSU football for about 20 minutes. We've actually not hit on spring practice itself. So uh, we're about halfway through, a little bit uh, past the halfway point now of spring ball. They're going to take a break here for a week uh, because of the holiday, obviously, uh, and uh, school is out. Well, really just uh, a but- long weekend, yeah. The long okay, all right. Well, well, go through the if you would go through walk us through the next uh, several three or four, four uh, practices. Just yeah, they practice the uh, on Thursday. And that was close to the media. They'll practice again on Tuesday. Uh, they just don't practice over the weekend for Easter. Give the guys off for that holiday, and then then it will uh, be pretty uh, a couple of practices in short succession from there to, through the spring game on April thirteenth. So they'll practice next Tuesday, next Thursday, next Saturday. And then a couple times a week after that, heading into the spring game there in Tiger Stadium. So uh, observations uh, from spring practice. There have been uh, changes in the secondary. It looks uh, as though uh, certainly last weekend uh, you had a chance to take a, a good long look. And uh, tell us, first of all, just tell us where the sort of the secondary stands with uh, you know Sage Ryan not only moving around, but now also you've got Jordan Gilbert and whoever else is coming in. So uh, just uh, reset some of that, if you would, to the extent that it's going to be reset at this point. Yeah, I'll hit on this uh, on this quick and and you know the big change is that Major Burns, uh, former uh, who have been in deep safety the last couple of seasons, is playing what's called the star position. The star position is more of a hybrid uh, defensive back, has some almost like outside linebacker responsibilities and certain looks. That's become you know mo- now in modern football, it makes sense for a defensive back to handle some of these things. And Major is now playing much closer to the football, um, almost in the box at times and down near the line of scrimmage. And the change with that him with him moving down there is now you've got an open spot at safety next to Jordan Gilbert, who is the transfer from Texas A&M. He's been a first team safety from the moment he stepped on campus. He'll be a starter in the fall as long as he stays healthy. Uh, is now that Sage Ryan is back at kind of a natural position for him. LC moved, has been moving him around a lot, excuse me, during his career. Um, but safety was always kind of his natural position. He gets to go back to that. We saw him have three interceptions on Saturday. Uh, to add some context to them, because they were all off of Garrett Nussmeyer and some people like, oh, gosh, what does that mean for Nussmeyer? You know, one of them was directly – they kept having Garrett throw directly into the wind. The offense was moving directly in that direction and really stiff wind on Saturday. And so he threw a deep ball to Chris Hilton, who split the safety in the corner. Um, and it just kind of seemed like the wind maybe affected that a little bit. Sage was able to catch back up to the ball and come down with a pick. On the second one, it was kind of in like a two-minute situational uh, period. Um, where LSU's offense is probably running the same plays quite a bit. But credit to Sage, he read what was coming uh, and picked it off for sort of what was somewhat of a pick six. And then the third interception was off of a tip. Uh, Jacoby and Guillory at the line of scrimmage, and Sage, Sage made the most of it. So that's kind of what you got dealing with at safety. Uh, in particular, is it, it, the real difference is that move with Sage or Bur- with, excuse me, the move that Major Burns made uh, into that star position now closer to the line of scrimmage and Sage now shifting over to, to the other safety spot next to Jarden. Corner is still a complete uh, competition. I mean, I, I think it's just too early to really name any sort of leaders in the clubhouse. That being said, what we have seen thus far is JV and Toviano and Ashton Stamps have kind of consistently been with the first team defense. Makes sense, as those are guys who started near the end of last year, have been in the program. Um, you've still got J.K. Johnson's appears limited. Zy Alexander is coming off an ACL. And Jaya Brown is just now transferring in as well as P.J. Woodland, an early enrollee, all, you know, all those guys are still kind of um, – they haven't overtaken J.V. or, or Ashton. Um, but there's going to be quite a bit of competition uh, all the way throughout the rest of the spring and into the preseason too. Uh, tell us about the wide receiver position. This is, again, going to be a position that's not going to be settled and, and set and straight uh, leaving spring. Uh, but certainly uh, players like Ky- Kyron Lacey can uh, do, do a lot to help themselves – uh, Chris Hilton as well, some of the other, uh, and of course, some of the other youngsters. Kyron Lacey and Chris Hilton have been the two may, uh, sort of, uh, I guess, risers at that receiver position here throughout the first half of spring football. Brian Kelly said of Kyron Lacey that he was the third guy last year uh, within that room, you know, and now he's the man and he's sort of approaching everything like that, you know, handling himself in that way. 
that, you know, excuse me, Garrett Nussmeyer complimented what he's done so far this camp a, a couple of weeks ago um, and saying some of the social media clips that LSU has shared is pretty representative of what Howard has done. And the bits of the practice that we've seen, that absolutely looks correct. There was a, probably one of the highlights of practice last Saturday was that Garrett threw a deep ball to Kyron. Again, it looks like it just maybe got held up in the wind a little bit. And Kyron snatched the ball pretty much off of Jardin Gilbert's helmet uh, and then just kind of trotted it into the end zone. It was a fantastic catch. And this is a guy who looks like he is um, really – I mean, he's going to be a starter uh, on this team, for, by, I, I believe. And um, he, he looks like he might be able to now take that next step too, which that's the thing. It's You know, Kyron was a starter last year. Now he needs to just be more consistent. And Brian Kelly said that he has been so, certainly in his approach to practice, um, which is a big thing uh, for him. And so, and then Chris has been able to be a lot more consistent too. That's another, again, the kind of the main word with him, you know, not some of the drops that he'd had uh, and really just in his approach to what he's doing. Um, he, he's got a lot more confidence uh, out there. He said that he's done some work uh, with one of LSU staff members on just feeling more confident and really, you know, part of that was the first half of his career. He was pretty much injured all the time. He's so he's healthy again, has been for a while. And now it's, but it's really showing up, you know, that he's now going into his fourth year on campus. Um, you know, LSU signed CJ Daniels and Xavier Thomas as kind of those replacements for Malik and for Brian, especially in terms of their experience. But Chris has been with, along with Kyron, one of those first team receivers uh, throughout the first half of spring practice here. I'm sure that, you know, CJ Daniels and Xavier Thomas are going to be in the mix. Um, but so far they've been on the second team offense and Chris has held down a spot there along with Kyron. And those have kind of been, a, uh, you know, two of the players who have stood out so far. Would be an enormous, uh, would be an enormous boon to LSU. Uh, you're not going to replace neighbors and Thomas one for one. It would be obviously be an enormous boon for LSU if Kyron Lacey and Chris Hilton were continuing to make uh, great steps in addition to the additions of Xavier Thomas and CJ Daniels, as you said. Uh, of course, everybody wants to ask about, uh, and we'll wrap it up here with, with just a couple of more, but everybody wants to ask about Harold Perkins. How's he doing? It's hard to tell, honestly. It, it's just too early. I mean, we, all we've seen thus far is Blake Baker working with him on inside linebacker technique. Um, at this point, we've gotten <laughs> one full practice and three 20-minute openings to practice. Um, we also haven't gotten the chance to talk to Blake or Harold. And so uh, it's, it's just too early to really say. I don't know if we're really going to know until kickoff against USC. Um, you know, it's not like they're going to show a whole lot of exotic things during the spring game or anything like that. Maybe we'll start to get a better sense, um, you know, over the next the rest of spring practice and into preseason camp. Um, but don't be surprised, listeners uh, out there, if you don't really know uh, going in uh, to the season. Um, because like we said, the, the one – the thing that is encouraging is just how hands-on Blake has been with Harold and with those other linebackers. I mean, he's the linebackers coach in addition to being the defensive coordinator. Um, but part of the reason for optimism uh, with Harold moving back to that inside linebacker position that might work this time is Blake Baker's coaching. We've seen Blake with his cleats on, um, which is uh, a little funny thing about him. He wears cleats out to practice. Um, he is, you know, again, really just hands-on with Harold, working with him on a lot of different technique stuff, trying to get him, to really fully understand that inside linebacker position. Uh, one other thing to, to touch on, the offensive line and the run game. The run game certainly, uh, in, in your mind, looked uh, looked pretty strong uh, last weekend. Yeah, we could do an entire podcast on the run game alone, and I'm sure at some point that we will, because it is completely different <laughs> uh, in so many ways. LSU, you saw it right off the bat uh, in that practice last week has really put in a focus on the run game to here because it's implementing some different styles and schemes to what it over what it did last year. DJ Chester got the chance to talk to him. He said it's not like this wasn't in the playbook, but it's not what they were drawing out of the playbook uh, last year. And so now they're really harping on these new things that they're doing. Uh, you're seeing pulling tackles, which is a big part of this, is the athleticism that you get with Will Campbell and Emory Jones. LSU wants to highlight that. So they're getting those guys out on the edge in the perimeter outside runs. We saw that. We saw tosses. We saw Garrett Nussmeyer going under center um, and even doing some play action rollouts. Um, things that just LSU did not run the last couple of years uh, is certainly now part of the offense, uh, as we've talked about before, and as we'll continue to throughout this offseason, because it's a big piece of what's whether or not this team will be successful next year is whether or not it can get more out of the run game in this way. And so it's obvious that it's going to be different. It's not like it's just offseason talk. Like we're seeing it with our own eyes. This is different schematic stuff than they had in the, the last two years. And it is all building off of that offensive line um, and what they believe is going to be a real strength of this team 
you would think so with four returning starters. Um, and that's kind of what we've seen out of it so far. Uh, Wilson, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a beautiful day outside. I know the Braves are going to be playing here before long. Are you going to try to uh, sneak in a chance to, uh, to work on that short game we talked about? <laughs> um, uh, maybe if uh, we get oh, the Braves the are postponed, you got all day. Yeah, the uh, Braves. Yeah, we've got, we, uh, but hey, we still got some spring football work to do and and all that, and then uh, heading down to oh. with my wife's family for to see them for the Easter holiday. So I don't Man, think I'll right. be able forgot, to work on my short games today. Now, unfortunately, I forgot about <laughs> I forgot about I forgot about work and Easter. Man, that's that's tough. It's gonna it's gonna cut into your uh, to your golf game time. Uh, uh, Koki, I'll send uh, I'll offer my condolences in advance on the Red Sox season. I'm going to guess it's not going to be a vintage year, <laughs> oh. but we also Ooh. we also are not going to feel very sorry for you because you've been loading up on rings uh, pretty much all four of your major sports. Up. Oh no, you don't have to feel sorry for me, but I it's you know speaking of teams that need pitching, oh boy, um, the, <laughs> the, the Red Sox could use some of the LSU starting pitchers. I'll, I'll just keep it at that. So I, I want somebody to feel sorry for me because if I'm wearing an Expos hat, you know, what kind of baseball I've, uh, I've been, what, what kind of baseball I've not been enjoying for the past 20 years now, since they hit the road, brewers aren't the same in either. So, but uh, not that anybody cares that much. I think everybody else would just as soon uh, stop listening to us and get to some baseball too. But uh, everybody, we appreciate you all uh, tuning in. Of course, you know, the, you know where to find us. Uh, we are here every Monday and Thursday on the LSU sports insider. We've got plenty to discuss as we go down the road. Uh, we'll be back to discuss, obviously, the LSU women's run and the NCAA tournament. More, sp- much more spring football to come. Obviously, much more baseball to come. We're almost at the halfway point now. The regular season, Koki, as I'm sure you know. Uh, so we've got uh, we've got a lot still on our plate, and we'll be here uh, Monday and Thursday all the way through the uh, through the end of the of the count cal- of the academic calendar year. So uh, stick with us. Uh, please go to theadvocate.com/slash subscribe to the Advocate. Uh, or to subscribe to the advocate uh, and stay hold stay up to date on everything with uh, with our LSU newsletter. You can get a hold of that by going to theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. Uh, we are here, as I said again, uh, every Monday and Thursday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever other finer podcasts are found. Uh, and of course, uh, perhaps more importantly, we are here on YouTube live every Monday and Thursday. If you don't catch us live on our YouTube channel, LSU Tigers and Nola.com. Uh, you can catch us on that same YouTube channel after the fact. That's uh, LSU Tigers on Noah.com on YouTube. So please subscribe to that as well. And please check out our friends at Champion Wealth Strategies to uh, to find out more about them and all their services. You can go to championwealthstrategies.com and plan like a champion today. Gentlemen, I appreciate you uh, hanging out with us for about an hour. We had a little te- technical difficulty to start up, but uh, that's the way it goes. You figure out, you adapt. Uh, and overcome, and we are off and running. So, gentlemen, we do appreciate you. Uh, for uh, for Koki Riley up top there, for Wilson Alexander, bringing up the rear. This is Perrin Keys. This has been the LSU Sports Insider. <laughs>